Ever since the dawn of written language, text and image have appeared in the art of humans. Words turn up with images to inform, explain, warn, clarify, and chronicle. When books were handwritten, scribes would embellish their manuscripts with beautiful calligraphy. With the invention of the printing press, typography, the study of letter forms, became part and parcel of the designer's toolkit. In the new modern art of the 20th century, text has played different roles. Visual artists have exploited the work of typographers while including printed material in their collages. Sometimes the text acts as just another formal element. Sometimes it is a subject matter. Sometimes it sheds light on the context of the work. In this video, we are going to explore how some contemporary artists integrate text and image. But we're going to focus on art where the text is integral to the meaning of the work and not just a pictorial device. While we won't follow a chronological history, we'll loosely group our artists into four categories. Remember, back in 1917 with his ready-mades, Duchamp postulated that art existed in the mind. In the 1960s and 70s, some artists began to explore the limits of art as idea, the nature of signs and symbols, and the legitimacy of the art object. If art was an idea, was it necessary to produce an object at all? This work came to be known as conceptualism. And while it took many forms, some artists specifically used language as the main element of their work. Lawrence Feiner was one of the first artists to go to this extreme of dematerializing the art object. In 1968, Feiner created the book Statements, which consisted of text describing sculpture projects that were never carried out. The logical conclusion is that if no art object is necessary, then the art existed in the viewer and not in the artist. Conceptual work requires the viewer to engage actively for art to happen. In 1969, Joseph Kosuth wrote, the value of artists after Duchamp can be weighed according to how much they question the nature of art. Kossuth questions the nature of meaning and existence in one in three chairs, which included an actual chair, a photograph of a chair, and a printed definition of a chair which hung on the wall. Much of his work explored this space between language, object, and idea. Mel Bachner started out as an art historian. For an exhibition he was asked to curate at the School of Visual Arts in New York. He invited 100 friends to submit a drawing. He Xeroxed these drawings so that they were all the same size and placed them in binders, which were on sculpture pedestals in the gallery. The exhibition was titled, Working Drawings and Other Visible Things on Paper Not Necessarily Meant to be Viewed as Art. This is seen by some as the first conceptual art exhibition. One artist, Donald Judd, had given Bachner as his drawing a fabricator's bill for a sculpture Judd had had made. In Judd's mind, this was just as much a part of the art as the actual object. Sue Bing explores these issues of language and communication in the pictographic nature of the Chinese characters. He created his own Chinese-like characters, which have no meaning. In this Book from the Sky project, he printed them as if they were an actual Chinese text. This juxtaposition makes us question our assumptions about meaning and communication, just like the work of his Western counterparts. This statement sums up Douglas Hubler's approach to being an artist. He turned from making objects to documenting various actions that involve social environments and the passing of time. The text explains the project, which almost renders the image redundant. On Kawara's Today series consists of that day's date painstakingly painted on a canvas. The project began on January 4, 1966, and is planned to end only with Kawara's death. The date is always painted in the language of the country he is in at the time. He is still alive. And I got up, another project which lasted from 1968 to 1979. Each day Kawara sent two postcards from the location where he was, with the time he got up stamped on the postcard. Some artists use image and text to point out the irony and absurdity of life. When Bruce Nauman left art school, he didn't know what to do. One day he had the realization that, if I was an artist and I was in the studio, then whatever I was doing in the studio must be art. He began documenting with film what he did in the studio. Because he was so poor, this often consisted of simple actions. Later his work began exploring the use of language and visual puns 
and the inherent problems with clear communication. Ed Ruscha began using words as a main component of his work in 1961. His paintings and drawings often present humorous phrases or non sequiturs that are contrasted with an image or painterly background. Sometimes considered a California pop artist, his work is often self-conscious about its use of artistic tradition while lampooning that tradition at the same time. Mary Reed Kelly uses image and text to address the reality of living as a woman in today's world and the disconnect between that reality and an idealist fantasy of what life is supposed to be. Text and image is a powerful tool for manipulation. There's a fine line between art and propaganda. Or maybe it would be more accurate to say that art and propaganda coexist on an ever-shifting field. These next artists use the techniques of mass communication to address various states of oppression and injustice. China is a rapidly changing country. In the internet age, growing pains are hard to hide and explain away. Zhang Dali's work shows the effects of these growing pains. He began as a graffiti artist, spray painting large portraits of himself on Beijing buildings scheduled for demolition. His portrait of migrant construction workers illuminate the plight of those caught up in the growing income equality in China. The work of Hans Hakka is concerned with exposing the systems behind many of our institutions. In a famous work, Haka documented the underhanded dealings of New York slumlord Harry Shapolsky. This work was to be included in a solo show of Haka's work at the Guggenheim Museum. But six weeks before the scheduled opening, the director of the museum canceled the show for what the director called artistic impropriety. Haka went on to expose the dealings of other institutions that Americans assumed were working in good faith. Gorilla Girls are a collection of women artists who take on the chauvinistic nature of the art world. When they appear in public at exhibitions or lectures, they wear gorilla masks. Their work is a no-holds-barred use of text and image to expose the sexism in the art world. Barbara Kruger began her career as a graphic designer for Mademoiselle magazine. Her work addresses notions of power, consumerism, sexism, and the links between all three. She has said, I work with pictures and words because they have the ability to determine who we are and who we aren't. Employing the technology of mass communication, Jenny Holzer's work also addresses systems and institutions. Utilizing LED displays, powerful projectors, posters, and even t-shirts, she uses text sometimes poetically, sometimes as prose, to expose the prejudices and injustices of society. In one particularly moving series, she reproduced letters from soldiers, their families, and the families of POWs in the Afghan war, which had been declassified by the U.S. government but showed a side of the war not seen by the American people. Glenn Ligon uses text and image to confront the viewer with his experience of being a dual minority in America, that of being African American and gay. His work draws on the subtext and hidden meanings in the history of being black in America, as well as the prejudice against homosexuality. Storytellers is perhaps a misnomer here. These next artists use text in their work, and even some stylistic elements taken from comic books or graphic novels, but their stories are not linear narratives. Rather, their work taken as a whole reveals stories about culture and society. 
Zhang Wan is known primarily as a performance and installation artist, but much of his work deals with story. In this work, titled Family Tree, a calligrapher writes on Zhang's face the names of family members and stories from the family lore until his head is completely covered. In My Boston, he explores the dislike he had as a child for reading and the pressure his mother put on him to educate himself for a secure future. Here he is using text in a different way, literally being crushed by the weight of the books and hence the knowledge he was supposed to digest. Both Carrie James Marshall and Mark Bradford address the trap for African Americans of the exploitive cycle of institutionalized poverty. Marshall's Garden series explores the irony between the utopian ideal behind the public housing projects and the reality of what they too often become for the mostly minority residents. Mark Bradford uses the signs posted around the Los Angeles neighborhood where he grew up that advertise businesses that appear to be helpful but in reality mean to take advantage of the poor. He gathers up these signs for easy term loans, cash for cars, schemes to help you make money, and incorporates them into multi-layered work that reveal the contrast between exploited and exploiter. Raymond Pettibone's graphic style depicts the outsider and the deviant. His work initially appeared in self-published photocopied booklets. His drawings include text of his own writing or quotes from well-known authors. While not narratives per se, the image and text in his work often puts the viewer in the uncomfortable position of voyeur watching a scene we were not meant to witness. For his best known work, The Humament, Treat a Victorian Novel, Tom Phillips randomly purchased a Victorian novel from a bookshop and began drawing on the pages. Leaving certain words exposed creates a kind of spontaneous found story. This found text is reminiscent of some of the work of Christian Zara and the Surrealists from the mid-20th century. Phillips creates his own story of lost love and the search for art. Questions of language and meaning, signs and symbols, text and subtext, permeate more than the visual arts of the 20th and 21st century. Music, theater, literature, and philosophy influence and have been influenced by these questions as well. The very notion of what art is and what art is for is an ongoing investigation for artists and thinkers from many disciplines.